This video is brought to you by Squarespace. January 2017. The COVID pandemic is still three years away, and it was a simpler, happier time. But then, across the world, newspaper headlines make a chilling announcement. Journalist Sinan Maloney has come forward with startling new evidence about the Titanic disaster. Some new photos of the ship had emerged, and Maloney found something terrifying. A threatening black smudge. This, he said, was incriminating. Since 1912, we've known that Titanic was on fire the day she left Southampton on her maiden voyage, and Maloney said this photo shows the actual spot of the fire burning through the hull plates and distorting them from the outside. If what he says is true, it means Titanic's hull was badly compromised even before it hit the iceberg. The fire, he said, was raging out of control and was potent enough to turn this part of the outside of the ship black. By his calculations, the raging inferno inside the ship reached 1000 degrees Fahrenheit, warping one of the ship's critical watertight bulkheads. He said the bulkhead was not worthy of the name. It completely compromised the ship and led to an accelerated sinking. Titanic couldn't stay afloat long enough for an effective rescue. Not only that, but Maloney points out that Titanic was speeding up towards the ice field ahead of it. Why? Because the ship's crew were trying to pull out the burning coal in a desperate attempt to fight the blaze. But where do you put the coal? Well, into the ship's boilers. Well, this, of course, speeds the ship up. It all paints a convincing picture. Maybe the iceberg just finished off what the fire started. Well, it sounds convincing enough, except for one problem. None of it makes any sense. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and today let's answer the question, did a coal fire sink the RMS Titanic? These photos of Titanic are some of my favourites of all time. The ship's newly finished with the gleaming paint scheme, and final preparations are being made at Belfast before she sails for Southampton on her maiden voyage. But there in this photo, you can see a black smudge on the hull. Some would have you believe this is the site of a coal fire burning deep within the ship. But before we take a look at the evidence and get an idea of what it would mean for the Titanic to be burning in such a way, let's take a look at the situation here. Why was there a coal fire? Where was it within the ship? And what happened because of it? We all know Titanic was fueled by coal. The ship was expected to make regular round trips from Britain to the United States running at fairly high speed, and she'd need to carry a monumental amount of coal. In fact, she'd need to carry enough coal to safely make it to New York and back again with more to spare. So ample storage was provided for tons of the stuff. 6,600 odd tons of coal, to be exact, or about 12 or 13% of the ship's entire displacement. The coal was loaded from barges called lighters when she was in her home port. Men would shovel buckets full and then swing them into open doors called coal ports in the ship's hull. The coal's purpose was very simple. It would burn in the ship's boiler furnaces, heating water into enough steam to power the main engines, the electrical engines, the deck handling equipment, and many other bits of steam-powered machinery. Now that's a lot of steam, so Titanic would need to be burning a lot of coal to create it. In fact, Titanic would be burning around 600 to 800 tons of coal each and every day when she was crossing the Atlantic, and all of it was shoveled by hand by hundreds of stokers into the mouths of the furnaces. The Titanic's coal was stored in special compartments called bunkers, which bracketed the boiler rooms where it was easy for the stokers to shovel it in. Now before we take a look at how the boiler rooms were actually laid out, I do have a quick word and a small announcement about today's sponsor. I'm actually in the process right now of redesigning my website. I've had it for about five years now, and I'm going to be taking all of the scripts for videos like this and turning them into articles with diagrams and handy graphics that explain everything, along with some additional points that I didn't get to include in the video, and some kind of behind the scenes visuals. Now for this huge task, I'm using Squarespace, which is definitely the most elegant website builder that I've ever used. I've had my website online and built it with Squarespace all the way back in 2018. The layouts are so clean and clear. If you want to build a website with a focus on photos and images like mine, then Squarespace is the way to go. It's so easy to use, you can just drag and drop pictures into your pages, link products. There's a ton of features. If you want to build or run a blog, there's a whole separate function for this, which is really easy to use. As well as this, you can check out your analytics to see just where people are viewing your website from, which is always a great feeling. It's all really in depth and really easily laid out. I highly suggest giving Squarespace a try. It's so simple, easy to use, and the results are fantastic. 
Visit squarespace.com today to try building your own website for free. And then when you're ready to buy a domain or make a purchase, visit squarespace.com slash designs to get a nice little 10% discount. It's as easy as that. But make sure that you share a link to your website in the comments below so that we can all go and check it out. Now, back to Titanic. Let's take a look at the layout of the boiler rooms and see how it all works. The massive main boilers were double-ended, so all except for one of the boiler rooms were effectively mirror images of each other, and were fairly simple in their layout. In the centre of the boiler room were the boilers in a row with narrow alleyways between them called passes, where the crew could sneak through if they needed. Then at either end of the boilers could be found a bunker, a vast empty space where the coal had been loaded in from the ship's side. Titanic's bunkers stood very tall, with their roofs above the ship's waterline all the way up at F deck. The bunkers were made of fairly thin steel plate that uh, extended across the width of the ship. It was about 0 0.30 of an inch thick. We all know Titanic was famously divided into a series of what were called watertight compartments, separated by tall watertight bulkheads. Now these ran across the width of the ship as well, and ran up above the waterline, pierced only by watertight doors that could be closed, as well as steam lines and other openings that were made so that they could not allow any water through them. The watertight bulkheads essentially separated the coal bunkers from one another and enclosed the boiler rooms. Apart from having doorways and other holes that were sealed, what made the watertight bulkheads watertight was their ability to stand up to the crushing weight of water. Water pressure increases linearly. Simply, the deeper you go, the more pressure there is. If one of Titanic's watertight compartments flooded, you would have the weight of hundreds of tons of water being held back by a single steel wall, the watertight bulkhead. And the stresses would be concentrated at its base. Because of this, the bulkheads were reinforced and gradually got thicker towards the bottom. Up here at ENF deck, they were about 0.3 of an inch, but down here at the boiler room level, they grew to just over half an inch thick. Now, I promise this will come in handy to know later on. It meant that the coal bunkers on either side of the watertight bulkheads were designed only to hold coal, not the weight of hundreds of tons of water. They were dust tight, so dust and fumes couldn't escape, but they could not be expected to hold back any flooding. That was the job of the watertight bulkheads. To get to the coal, the bunkers had small doors that could slide upward so that a measure of it could be shoveled out and then loaded into the furnaces by the stokers. Now, connecting all the boiler rooms were passages that ran through the watertight bulkheads and through a little tunnel, which ran through the coal bunkers. And because of this, you could have walked right through every boiler room on the ship, and between the boilers through the passes that I mentioned earlier. Those passages through the watertight bulkheads could be closed with the watertight doors from the bridge. Now these doors were famously activated primarily by an electric switch, which was a huge innovation for the time. So now that we understand how the boiler rooms and the bunkers were set up, we can actually talk about the fire. It started here in a bunker known as Bunker Y, which supplied the aft or rear end of boiler room 6. Now the bunker's back was the watertight bulkhead that led through to boiler room 5. Now this backed immediately up on the bunker W, which fed coal to the forward end of Boiler Room 5. Now, journalists and others have claimed that the fire started weeks before the Titanic set sail, but this just doesn't seem likely or realistic at all. Burning coal would have smouldered out by then, and firefighting efforts could have smothered the fire long before the ship left for New York. In fact, it seems likely to have started in Southampton, because orders were given for coal to be removed from the bunker in just the first watch out of port. But how does a load of coal catch on fire anyway? Well, the answer may not be what you think. Obviously, having boiling hot furnaces next to tons of coal seems like a recipe for disaster, but strict measures were taken to prevent sparks or embers from flying back and igniting the coal in the bunkers. What can start a spontaneous combustion of coal is water. If coal gets wet, it can begin to oxidize and decay, generating heat, which can lead to an ignition. It was fairly run-of-the-mill stuff. In fact, Titanic's owner's parent company, the International Mercantile Marine, had a rule that said this. The respective senior engineers of each watch, before going off duty, must go through the coal bunkers and note their condition on the log slate, and should there be any signs of spontaneous combustion taking place, they are at once to report the same to the chief engineer, who is immediately to notify the commander. Now, fires aboard ships, if left unchecked, can be absolutely devastating, but the coal bunker fire on the Titanic was completely different. It was confined to an enclosed metal space, which had been made fume and dust tight. It couldn't spread because the doors were shut. All it could do was smolder away inside the bunker until all the coal could be removed, 
or it could be doused with water in port. It didn't put the ship at risk, but it should have been dealt with, so a detail of men worked around the clock during Titanic's maiden voyage, shoveling coal out of the bunkers on either side of the boiler room 5 and 6 watertight bulkhead. In fact, the space here, directly behind the fire on the starboard side of the ship, had its bunker, Bunker W, emptied entirely of coal. Now this is all really important because this was the part of the ship that was damaged by the iceberg, but only just. When Titanic came into contact with the berg, it seems to have made a series of small cuts in the ship's hull, and it was the last of these that really doomed the ship. It just nicked Boiler Room 6, and then the newly emptied Bunker W in Boiler Room 5, just behind where the fire was burning. But that final cut in Boiler Room 5's bunker meant that boiler room would flood. Well, why? Well, because the bunkers, remember, were not made to be watertight. They were plated in steel, only 0.3 of an inch thick, and not designed to hold back water. So what does this mean for Maloney's coal fire theory? Well, let's take a back up for a minute and review that famous smudged photograph that we were talking about from earlier. A cursory examination of the photo against Titanic's plans tells us the smudge is actually in line with a lot of third-class cabins, which were occupied during the voyage and presumably not on fire, and a lot of cargo storage. Damningly though, the actual location of the fire is way back here, and about a deck below the smudge in the photo. So if not the visual effect of a burning coal fire, then what is it? Well, Titanic's hull was painted in a semi-gloss black, which provided a little reflectivity from certain angles. Seems like the smudge is really just a reflection of the dock next to the ship. In fact, lots of photos of Titanic and its sister ship Olympic show the hull as all sorts of shades of black as light bounced off it. The photo simply doesn't show the result of any fire down below. Now we know that at some point during the voyage, Titanic's coal bunker was on fire, but what did it mean for the ship on the actual night of the sinking? Well, remember that Sanan Maloney said that the fire had warped and then damaged the watertight bulkhead. He said, quote, the bulkhead was not worthy of the name, it completely compromised the ship and led to an accelerated sinking, Titanic couldn't stay afloat long enough for an effective rescue. So first of all, that last sentence is extremely unfair on Titanic and the men that designed and built her. The ship had been mortally wounded, was taking on tons of water, but still stayed afloat over two hours on an even keel without rolling over or dropping like a stone. But was the watertight bulkhead damaged from the fire and did it lead to an accelerated sinking at all? Well, at about 1.10am, as Titanic's crew were struggling to save the ship, Boiler Room 6 had flooded, and Boiler Room 5 was still dry, except for the coal bunker at W, which had its coal doors shut. Suddenly there was a loud roar, and leading fireman Frederick Barrett said, A rush of water came through the pass, the forward end, a space between the boilers where we walked through. I never stopped to look where the water came from, I went up the escape ladder. Barrett had actually been involved in the efforts to remove coal from Bunker W earlier on the opposite side of the fire in Bunker Y, and upon doing so he had made a discovery. He said, The bottom of the watertight compartment was dinged aft, and the other part was dinged forward. It looks like the intense heat of the blaze had warped somewhat the lower part of the bulkhead, and another fireman said it was dented a bit. Yes, warped. I just brushed it off and got some black oil and rubbed over it. Now does this mean that the bulkhead's strength had been compromised? Had it then collapsed and allowed tons of water into Boiler Room 5, making the ship sink faster? Well, no, because as we all know, any good fire needs a constant supply of oxygen in order to burn at its hottest. Without a steady flow of oxygen, coal will continue to smolder at around 750 degrees Fahrenheit. But here's the thing. The steel plating, over half an inch thick, as used on Titanic's watertight bulkheads, would need to be heated to 900 degrees Fahrenheit to even glow red hot. A forensic study was run on a piece of steel plating identical to Titanic's bulkhead, which was then riveted to floors and hull plates to simulate the real thing. It was heated to 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit, and even then, it had only distorted by about 6 inches, and the rivets holding the whole thing together had only been stressed to about 10 or 20% of their failure point. It doesn't seem likely or possible that the watertight bulkhead failed. It was designed to hold water in, and it was over-engineered. Even then, a raging fire couldn't weaken it sufficiently to fail, but only to make it slightly distort its flat shape at the base. The culprit for the sudden rush of water at 1.10am is kind of obvious. Bunker W. The bunker was flooding, and its plating was never designed to hold water in. 
We know the bunker had been emptied, so by about 1.10am, we can gather it was probably now straining under the weight of about 450 tonnes of seawater. It was just never designed to handle that kind of pressure, especially not the little sliding cold doors. It seems most likely that one of the doors burst, allowing all those tonnes of water to roar in between the passes of the boilers. If the main watertight bulkhead had failed, so many tonnes of seawater would have roared in that nobody could have hoped to have escaped in time. But instead, we know that Fireman Barrett had time to run up the escape ladder and get out of the room. Now, the final ridiculous claim by Maloney involves the ship's speed. And this is a real doozy. He claimed that Captain Smith had ordered the burning coal to be loaded into the ship's boilers, thus creating more steam and speeding the ship up. But it's not just the amount of coal being loaded into the boiler furnaces that regulates the ship's speed. For the engines to turn at the desired speed, steam pressure had to be maintained, sure, but too much steam was a serious issue. If it built up and had nowhere to go, it could lead to an explosion. So Titanic's four funnels were each fitted with two big steam waste pipes on their front and rear aspect. It meant that if too much steam were being created, it could be vented out as harmless vapour. If Maloney were right and the crew was trying to dispose of the burning coal by loading it into the boilers, Titanic could have sailed along at its normal service speed and had the excess steam simply vented out of the funnels. In fact, on the night of the sinking, the sudden stoppage of the ship resulted in a massive buildup of steam because the ship had only just been moving at near full speed. and It was vented out of the funnel waste pipes, creating a monstrous roar that made it nearly impossible to hear what anybody was saying on deck. When the water finally roared in to Boiler Room 5 at 1.10am that night, did it cause the Titanic to sink faster? Well, not really. It was already flooding and taking on water. We know the main watertight bulkhead didn't fail, but the coal bunker probably did. That released about 440 tons of seawater into the boiler room, but from then on it could only flood at the rate at which Barrett had seen water entering the bunker earlier in the night. He described it as being like that of a steady fire hose. Not a huge amount. Besides, Titanic would stay afloat for over an hour yet. It's hardly the dramatic tale of a bulkhead collapsing and then Titanic dropping like a stone. Every piece of media has to be consumed with a grain of salt because everybody is trying to sell you something or has an agenda or is trying to convince you of something like I am right now. The idea of the Titanic coal bunker fire is made for great publicity to sell books and documentaries challenging the established narrative. And since 2017, there have been thousands of articles parroting the same stuff that the fire was raging out of control, that you can see it in photographs, and that it led to the ship's bulkheads collapsing in a domino effect that doomed the ship. But the actual facts tell us that the coal fire wasn't out of control. It probably started just a few days before the sinking, and was in all likelihood put out the day before the ship even hit the iceberg. You can't see it in this photograph, it's impossible because the actual location of the fire is further back. It couldn't have caused the watertight bulkhead to collapse, it was just too tough. And even if it did, Titanic was already doomed and on its way to the bottom, and after Boiler Room 5 flooded, it stayed afloat for over an hour, allowing the ship's crew to get away all the lifeboats safely. And the idea of fire dooming the Titanic is tantalising, but it's just not based in reality. It's one of the many, many myths founded on bad history and sheer misinformation that continue to circle through books and the internet to this day. Do you know what? So long as the Titanic continues to sell books and print media and advertise a space, there'll just be a myriad of new theories that will just pop up every year, only for us to debunk them. Or should I say debunker them? Good night. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please think about liking and subscribing to the channel. You can support my channel on Patreon. You'll find the link down in the description. Until then, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.